All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have two poll questions to warm up the audience. Which ad channels would you like to determine return on ad spend first? If you really want to say, hey, was it, is it Google? Is it third-party marketplaces like Cars.com, AutoTrader, CarGurus, KBB? Is it my cable or broadcast? Or is it my social media? If I had to pick one endeavor to try to lock down, if I'm a dealer, what would I like to lock down first? What has the least visibility in your mind on return on ad spend? You really want to get to the bottom of that. Let's see how this plans out. Does this surprise any of you guys here on the panel here? So far, so far it is. Again, if you're a dealer, marketing manager, if you had a magic wand and you could leave here this week, <clears throat> which channel would you like to get a more accurate picture on your return on ad spend? All right, looks like third-party marketplaces, then broadcast, and uh, least is Google Paid Advertising. One other question. Okay. Do you believe next year, because of openness and partnerships, we'll see consistent engagement metrics across AutoTrader, KBB, Cars.com, Edmunds, and CarGurus? Do you think, what I'm hearing from everyone, is I'd like to see apples to apples comparison on engagement on my VDPs on cars.com, AutoTrader, KBB, CarGurus, activity, indirect referrals, direct referrals. I'm not sure if we know what the answer is yet, so let's keep on voting. This is a clear message to our colleagues at Cars, our colleagues at Cox, our colleagues at Car Gurus and Edmonds. I understand the fear of trying to be compared to someone else when it's your baby. I understand that. So if you're a true purple lover of Cars.com, of course you think your product overall is better than a competitor. But at the same time, the dealers in this room, there's over 1,000 rooftops represented by the managers and owners in this room. They're trying to figure out where should I be spending my money. And here's what my belief is. If the third party marketplaces were more transparent, the value would no longer be an issue. The value would no longer be an issue. The blind trust, in Google, the blind trust in television or cable, all of the other blind trust, for some reason, the third-party marketplaces have gotten a, a, a harder rap than they should. But it's been self-funded, I think, uh, and encouraged because of lack of transparency. So um, that's my call out to everyone here that are we going to move forward and make a true change? I have a great panel of people uh, here who've worked inside and outside of automotive. I love bringing people in who have a fresh perspective. So since most of these faces, except for Christian, um, may be you know, new to you, uh, if we would just start on the end and just one minute, what does your company do? Evan, what's core consulting? Let's pass down. Oh, you have a mic? Good. Evan, start there. Matt, do we have microphone lives here? Hold on. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, Core Consulting actually is about a week old company. Um, I uh, this is my fifth business, my fifth startup in digital marketing. Uh, so what this is focused on is teaching large businesses how innovation works, uh, and that's based on my entrepreneurial background. I sold a company to Adobe about four years ago, and ran product innovation for them. Uh, for about three years and kind of taught them how to think beyond 24 months out. Uh, but as far as it is concerned with attribution, obviously that's very core to the Adobe uh, Marketing Cloud product offering. I personally have been thinking about attribution and writing about attribution for about 12 years um, and 
didn't answer it 12 years ago. <laughs> I don't know that we still have answered it uh, yet, but uh, looking forward to sharing some stories and thoughts about it, kind of not just from the automotive perspective, but from others. And I had to kind of rethink all my answers because I will, I will say this crowd is not what I expected. This is, uh, I've, I've ta taught 101 a lot, and this is not 101. So uh, hopefully we'll Can have we some time. Can we get an amen here, from the audience on that? <laughs> Do you need another 101 conference? Leave the dealership costing you thousands of dollars opportunity time and someone's telling you, hey, you need to start doing Google reviews. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> um, all right, let's go. Uh, Andy. Hi, uh, Andy Jacobson. I've been at cars.com for three weeks um, and I'm actually uh, responsible. Yeah, responsible for the, yeah. Five days. These days. are people who get fired a lot from different jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. Um, Basically homeless, but nice people. My, re my responsibility there is to manage the national and regional ad sales as well as pro programmatic and data. But um, I'm here on this panel because my previous company um, was what I consider to be the SpaceX of the um, ad tech industry. And um, I work with a lot of um, clients directly in the retail space and travel. In, a, in other industries, so um, I have nothing to sell today. I'm just going to be talking about that experience and what I saw in terms of attribution um, there and in other industries. And I've also worked with, you know, um, outdoor advertisers and um, consumer electronics, health care, so I'll try to bring some of that in as well. Great. David? Uh, David Rifkin. This is my third day at Live Ramp. Um, no. Uh, so <laughs> I... Uh, as the head of strategic growth, I, I focus a lot on, on brands and, and how we grow from an innovation standpoint and push the needle on what they're doing. So a lot of it from what we're going to talk about, and especially if we go out of the auto space, really flows into a lot of what I do at LiveRamp. Um, and for LiveRamp, if you think about us as nothing else, think about us as the, as the pipes of the internet. So we have the ability to take data, whether it's offline, online, CRM, and move it to uh, a number of different destinations as well as have the ability to actually take that data back in an anonymous environment. So if you think about me, if in our system I'm XYZ123, then whether you find me on Google, Facebook, Twitter, I'm going to always be XYZ123 and allow you to take those insights that you find and use them across the ecosystem. Hi, folks. Yep, it's working. My name's Andy Dubikis. I lead what's called Solution Consulting Globally for Visual IQ. Uh, my group is really responsible for education of uh, prospects, partners, agencies, you name it, uh, really helping to um, bring some clarity to the murky waters that is attribution. Uh, and, and Visual IQ uh, recently was acquired by Nielsen. Um, our goal really is to help advertisers understand all of their marketing and advertising um, so that they can make better decisions around it. Great. Hey, I'm Chris. That was it. But uh, Christian, in case some folks weren't here yesterday. Okay, sorry, I'm assuming too much. I, I'm, I'm running a company called Datalicious. We're now part of Equifax. We've been doing um, attribution for close to five years now, and um, we're now going to do the same thing in, in the U.S. and try to bring some of our experience from from APEC into into the U.S. market. So excited to talk to you guys about that. Great. So um, I put some questions together that uh, any one of you can uh, kind of raise your hand and respond to. So. The automotive industry, as you know, spends billions of dollars on advertising, and, and oh, some of the OEMs have had insights into cross-device and multi-platform marketing. What is going to have to happen in order to bring that really maybe expensive or bigger thinking down to a retail auto group? How, what is your thoughts about that? About is it, is it coming soon? Is it really not going to be coming soon? It never will be there at a, you know, for an individual Jeep Chrysler store who wants to really understand the return on ounce spend? Yeah, it'll never be there. No, just, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's two sides to this story. So there's, there's a few industries where this is especially the case. You've got manufacturing, you've got pharmaceutical, you've got to some extent financial services, and of course automotive where you've got this like bifurcation in, in the entire business between things that happen above a line and things that happen below the line. Uh, there's really 
little preventing the data from being shared from a technical perspective. It's a much more political issue than it is a technical issue at this stage of the game, although there are a lot of legacy systems that keep a lot of the data on either side of the line that really aren't prepared to talk. So that can be patched, and it sounds like you're doing a lot um, to, to work toward that. The other side of it is I heard a really profound quote uh, a couple months ago, and I forget the source of this, but they said, quality is the act of building truth into your product. And this is a really cool concept when you think about attribution, because one way to interpret that quote is, if a product doesn't look like the real world behaves, it probably is not a quality product. It probably doesn't represent what's actually going on. So if you've got this idea that there's some optimal mix of ads that causes cars to get sold, that is not accurately depicting what it's like to be a customer. So what, what Christian proposed yesterday is a much higher quality concept, which is there are behaviors that these people exhibit, and you can tie the propensity of that buyer to those behaviors. Does it move them forward? Does it move them backwards? That is a far more accurate depiction of what's actually happening in the real world, both on the side of your business and from the customer's perspective. Therefore, that's the product that will emerge uh, in attribution as time goes on. So kind of two, two different answers, but hopefully that sheds a little bit of light, and I'm happy to get more into specifics on that. Great. Go ahead. Uh, to jump on that, I, I think, I think you're on the, you're, you hit it right on the money with the political standpoint. And there's, there's no doubt that there'll be some data and some information, some touch points. We talked about it before where people are going to the tier one page and you may not get access to that information, but it doesn't have to be perfect. If you can get yourself 75% of the way there by using your advertising budget, your CRM database, and using that to get insights for yourself, you're still significantly closer than you were in trying to get that full, that full scope of using that tier one. So what I would say is, more than anything right now, just take the data you have and use those assets. Those are, peop those are people. Those are people who are using experiences to use that data. Actually, I think they will actually not crack it. Like you were joking about it, but I think that's actually right. They won't do it ever. And when I say ever, it's probably they won't crack it in the next 10 years. That's probably long enough yeah, away. And the reason for that is, have a, like, who wants an iPad or an iPhone built into their car? Like everybody would think that would be an amazing experience compared to the rubbish that the electro electronics rubbish they're putting in there right now, right? They're about 10 years behind. And they have a completely different speed of innovation in terms of how reliable does need, something needs to be to go into a car. And I just don't think they can match the speed of innovation that has to happen in the digital space, the marketing space. They don't, the, whole op, the whole OEM organization doesn't operate on that level. I don't think they will actually get to that point. I, I have to disagree because I, I think they're already working on it. In fact, I know they are. Um, and uh, my last company was working with a couple of the OEMs to do just this, um, but they're just starting it. The, what shocked me in coming back into the auto industry is that we're still talking about clicks on the OEM side and leads on the dealer side. And now, fortunately, there's conferences like this where we can move beyond that and talk about what's really driving, moving the needle. But um, they realize that they're spending billions of dollars in advertising. They want to know how they can reduce waste, um, zero in on what's really working, um, and then eventually share that with you guys once they have the capability of doing it. But they're, they're partnering with companies like LiveRamp and Oracle and Adobe and Conversant, um, and uh, they're building those capabilities, Merkle, um, and it's just a matter of time before it can stand there. But this industry is very complex. You guys hold some data, they hold some data, they don't want to share the data, even with these platforms, to be able to get to this point. So unlike other retailers where they share the data and they'll give you transactional data, they give you a CRM data, they'll let you tag their site so you can do that triangulation, automotive is still wants to hold it closer to the vest, which I think slows it down. So, so let me make two comments. Number one, uh, recently I saw, not I saw, a, a client called me up and said, we got this GM product and it was from, I think, Epsilon uh, or, or Conversant, I forget which one, but it was a kind of a direct marketing, email marketing, bring all those pieces yeah. together. It has a product name and in all, I. I went to um, YouTube, I found the video which explained the product at the dealer, and I'm like, holy cow, this is really a productized version of you know, what we're talking about, and no one knows about it. Meaning, no one's talking about it, that we're making some first steps. So all the marketing departments that include CDK, Cox, there's a lot of education that we need to get out 
and, and sometimes we wait until the product's perfect. Maybe we're waiting too long. We have a huge knowledge gap. And if I, in my kind of perch in the industry, if, if just hearing for the first time that someone's kind of putting together a multi-touch, multi-platform, turnkey product for GM dealers, I was like, wow, you know, what is going on? Let's hit another question. Um, the, you've worked inside and outside of automotive. Some of the dealers here are critical of the largest companies like CDK and Cox Automotive and saying they're not innovating fast enough. And I don't know if that is a fair criticism or not because I don't have visibility into other industries at scale that are in the billions of dollars. Uh, is the auto industry behind? Is it at par? Is it actually ahead? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll tell you a story. I was, about this time last year, I was in Seattle meeting with Microsoft. Um, so you've heard of them, probably. And I, I was looking through their data before I got to the meeting, and this was about MSN, and I asked the question when we first started the meeting, what is the number one use case for MSN.com? And they said, some people said sports or politics, and there was a bit debate that kind of broke out. And I said, no, the number one use case for all of MSN.com is a person buying a new computer and changing their homepage away from MSN.com. <laughs> so, and they had no idea that this was the case. <laughs> so, you know, we're just taking the, the top line right off of the business, 20, 30 percent of their top line straight out of their pocket and all the perpetual ad revenue that goes along with that. So that's not necessarily about attribution, but that is to say that they were not seeing their business through their customers' eyes. And that is really what attribution should be focusing on, is, is trying to get around the other side of the screen and seeing through the customer's eyes and scoring that uh, pretty religiously. So this industry is, is behind in a sense that there are some technical issues that prevent it from being further along. But like I said earlier, I'm kind of blown away by how much progress has actually been made in this industry versus what I expected to hear at this conference. Um, I think there's still some very valid questions to ask, but you are certainly not alone in, in kind of a, a more global context. Great. Yeah, and I would just add to that. I think the important thing is to remember that there are different solutions out there, right? Um, it's easy for us to work with one partner or uh, look to that partner to do everything, uh, when in reality there are hundreds and hundreds of technology providers out there that can provide you different pieces, uh, other providers that bring those pieces together, um, different data providers. I think it's important to um, diversify the partners that you're working with um, such that you're getting different pieces from different partners and then looking to bring all those together. So if you, uh, if you single thread everything through one provider, you're going to have some gaps. And um, look, we just went to a conference the other day for Google and Facebook, and I can tell you those guys are not further along than you cracking that. They just integrated cross device and Google just integrated cross device into their attribution product and they're not very confident with the numbers that they're seeing. So it's a very, very new thing. Um, you guys are not behind. This is difficult and everybody's trying as hard as they can to fix it or it's going to take a little bit longer, but you're definitely not behind. Christian, yesterday you made a comment that I think went over the heads of some people, especially if they haven't worked in other countries. Like when I'm in Holland, they almost fall over about how the average American has no, I, no real care about, you know, data, you know, sharing, you know, like, hey, we just do it. And over in Holland, they're like, holy shit, you guys can get that, you can get that, you can get that. I'm like, yeah, we, we pretty much know everything. They're like, that's really creepy and scary. So Christian, you were in the Asian Pacific markets. In those markets, are they very, very different in the amount of data that can go into an attribution engine. Is the United States this weird island where no one gives a shit about like privacy and that we just literally push everything around? I, ho I hope so. Let's keep it that way. There's <laughs> <laughs> an awesome amount of data available here. Any other country on the world you go to, you have less. This is fantastic here. You guys are in a prime position to solve that. You know, in, in Asia, they don't even have a clean address for most, com for most, for most consumers. And, and privacy reg legislation in Europe is, is off the charts, right? So. This is perfect in the United States. Great. Any, uh, I was going to say on the question about cross-device attribution, I'm going to agree with Christian. Yeah, Google and Facebook can't even figure this out. In order for them to track you, you have to be logged into one of their properties. We analyzed 
a, a raw data set for one of our mutual clients at my last company, and Google could only see 7% of what Conversant could see. And um, it was only same device. It wasn't even cross-device, let alone offline. So, um, so they're trying to figure it out as well, and they have to work with even, uh, so they have the scale, but their privacy laws prevent them from tying that back to PII, which prevents them from tapping into their massive scale. So they rely on email addresses, which aren't as good as physical addresses and, and so forth. So, um, but the good news is there are companies that do that, um, LiveRamp, uh, Adobe, Oracle, who have this scale and can do that conversant. The bad news, at least in Conversant's case, maybe Adobe, Oracle, is that you have to be pretty big in order to, um, as an advertiser, to be able to afford to take advantage of their cross-device networks. That may not be the case with, with LiveRamp. I think to everyone's point, there's very few companies who are doing it phenomenally well. Right? I can tell you when I came to LiveRamp, um, give you an example, I, I, I dropped my phone, I broke it, no surprise, my three-year-old threw it in the floor. And so I go, I go to Samsung's website, look at their phone. Go to Verizon, see what it costs there. Actually went into Verizon and bought the phone. And the next day, all of my ads that I saw changed from Samsung to buying the phone to premium care. Now, knowing that I have a three-year-old, I signed up for Samsung premium care, and Samsung just got an extra 150 bucks out of me because they changed their ads and, and had that following the consumer all the way through. So there are brands that are doing it. I mean, Telco, I would say, is probably a major leader when it comes to this. But that's to the, my initial point of saying you don't have to be perfect. If you're, if you're close enough and you can actually use that consumer data, even in an anonymous form, you can make a lot of strategic decisions that are successful. Great. Let's hit another question. Um, let's look out for the next two years, which is almost a, a lifetime in this space. Do you see anything on the horizon that's going to allow a small to medium-sized business create more attribution model? Is there something coming that you can talk about that's non, you know, confidential that you could say, hey, um, I see this trend. It's going to be better for everyone in this room next year because anything? Do we? Do we? Or should we all be yeah. depressed? <laughs> Uh, I think two things, you know, at, at Visual IQ, um, you may have heard of us as kind of the enterprise attribution solution for a long time, and, and that's really how we were viewed. Uh, over the past 18 months, we've worked hard to start to work with SMBs and, and bring attribution, bring measurement, bring optimization decisions, uh, solutions to businesses of all sizes, right? And in the automotive industry, that, that has been true as well, right? We, we started working with the tier ones, uh, we've moved downstream to the tier twos. Now we're looking to move downstream to the, you know, to the, the dealers themselves. And so you're starting to actually see that. I think the key thing for that is, is uh, two key things. Um, number one, availability of data, right? As data becomes more available and it's available more quickly, that's going to enable providers such as Visual IQ, other folks on this, on this panel to do great work, right? So as data becomes more easily accessible and is available more quickly, you're gonna start to see that really take off. I think right. the other thing is, um, is bringing down that price point and bringing down uh, and removing the stigma that's associated with kind of advanced measurement and analytics. I think folks that work for SMBs maybe say, hey, we're too small, right? We can't do anything. Uh, I think removing that and working with folks to educate people in the marketplace that no matter what size you are, you need to understand what consumers are doing with your brand and make decisions off of that is going to go a long way. Great, any other comments? Yeah, um, I, I think, again, this kind of breaks down into a, a pair of things. Um, number one is, is certainly the trust issue. One thing that I was kind of maybe not surprised to hear, but surprised to hear the sheer volume of was how many people talked about the trust issues they have with various forms of data that they have coming inbound. Um, before this panel, so that I wouldn't be volunteering for somebody who was unwilling, I went and talked with Cars.com and Cox. And I asked them, would you be willing to create a specific corporate initiative and a panel of uh, industry people to close the gap on trust. Like, and, the, and both of them said absolutely that would be a huge priority for us because the lack of trust on both sides of the table is terrible for both sides of the table. Clearly for their business, they could sell much more efficiently and effectively if they didn't have any sort of those types of uh, ideas roaming around. And in your business, you could optimize your business a lot better. So I would encourage the people in this room to run toward that opportunity and, and get on that board. And dealers in this room, marketing managers, would it be a good thing for those two largest companies to solve the trust gap, yes or no? That really was a weak response. Remember, the executives are here in a room. 
Do you want the trust gap solved? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Nice. And that was kind of weak, too. <laughs> so, you know, I, nothing's going to happen. All right, and, and the other side of it is, um, again, get, getting into a propensity mindset. I think teaching an organization, particularly one that has such deep roots in traditional marketing and sales, about attribution is a technical kind of, uh, you know, it's just a pitch that's not going to be caught. And I think what's more, more viable in this environment is to talk about propensity, to, to go to people and when they say, how do I know this is working, you can say, because here's a picture of how it moves the person forward. And, and we know this. And what Christian showed you yesterday is literally a visualization of that data. You need to seek those types of, of things a lot because it helps people understand what attribution means underneath the surface. It means we're moving people forward, we're shortening the sales cycle, we're increasing the price per sale, whatever the case might be. That is what's going to help people wrap their heads around this. The complexity of people touch this, 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 and this through millions of different pathways, nobody's just going to, nobody's going to latch onto that message. So I think it's just a, a fool's errand to go down that road. Instead, let's substitute that message with what is making people more or less likely to buy throughout their journey. Great. Go ahead, Christian. Can I just add something to that? And uh, I don't want to put a downer on this, but you may, maybe may should have made that 2020 or 2025, right? Because this is, this is really difficult. I don't think you're going to see amazing change within the next year because it is really tricky. But we know that the, the big guys in the market are already working on the problem, and I think we've seen that from the responses and the stuff that was presented here. So I think the right guys that have the right scale are working on solving that for you, genuinely, I believe. Um, I think what, what dealers can maybe do is cut these guys a bit of slack. I get the feeling sometimes that in this industry it's gotten a little bit to the point of bean counting. You know, my result is a little bit different than over there and that, that's why I don't trust it anymore. Just, just remind yourself maybe that analytics is not about an exact result, it's about finding a big trend, something that's going up or down that you can exploit to generate value for the business. It's not about a percentage point difference here or there. So the dealers can maybe cut the big guys a bit more slack, they're working on it, and the big guys can maybe hurry up to get to the point and actually deliver the solution. And I think you, you, you may get something of value by the end of next year, maybe. Yeah. Yep, I, I, I love that. That's Christian, a lot of solid, sound, practical advice. Let's go uh, to a very, very practical question. You have AutoNation here, Lithia here, Sonic, Asbury, big, large groups representing hundreds of stores should they be thinking that they need to hire a data scientist? Is this uh, something you always outsource? Where, you know, at one time, dealers thought it was funny or insane eight years ago when I said you should have a content writer. Larger dealer groups, you should have a content writer. And I remember it was that digital dealer and people were tweeting, Pash thinks you should need a, you know. <laughs> okay, you, you do. Um, and, what about this? Do, do, do we see this as something that an AutoNation, a Lithia, a Penske would really benefit from, or is it, is it really best just to outsource? I mean, as, as someone who's at a digital data company, my answer is yes. Um, but, the, but the long answer is, it, you know, it could be a data scientist, it could be an agency, it just could be getting somebody more involved, but I think the answer is just be more conscious and focused on your data. If you're more conscious and focused on your data, then whatever, and you're doing whatever you've got to do to, to utilize that, that's the answer. What time do we got? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, data warehousing, yes, you, you can't say making your data actionable, right? That's the answer. It's, it's whatever you've got to do to make your data more actionable, that's what you should be focusing on. Yeah, I, I, I saw this question on the, on the um, when we were getting prepped for this, and I, I prepared a little something of my own for this particular question, which is... Is it like a song? Well, or, I, it, or a sonnet? Or a limerick? Can, a limerick? Can you, can you bring my ukulele up here, please? Um, who's heard of the Adam Sandler thing, are these people working out or having sex? You've never heard of that? So he plays an audio clip, and you're supposed to guess which one it is. So uh, I've got an audio clip, and, and that is, are, is this an island full of penguins incubating their eggs or a group of data scientists talking about their data? So if you guessed data scientist, you're right. There, there's a strategic value conversation about 
the, the value of data to an organization. And I think if you talk to any CEO who would answer that yes, data is strategically value, uh, valuable to my, to my organization, they would actually say no, David or Susan is valuable to my organization. They would talk about a person who is creating value, who has a vision for what to do with the data. Organizations that kind of stockpile data and then hope that those eggs will incubate into little creatures that walk around and save the day, they're hopeless because the data is not like, the data does not hatch into anything. You need brilliant minds who understand the strategies of your business. So to this question, I think some could have it in-house, but I would probably recommend everybody start with something that's an agency or something that's outside because they'd be able to say, hey, I just did this the other day for a pharmaceutical brand. Maybe this model will work on your data. I just did this for a telecom. Maybe this model will work on your data. Having that person's ability to kind of switch context between industries and borrow inspiration for one or two years is far more valuable than building a huge backlog of Q&A for that person under that roof. And, and two comments, like data scientists are really hard to find and they're massive geeks and they're only, they only like to be in groups like that, you know, there needs to be always, <laughs> there always needs to be 10, they need to feed off each other, you know, like buff <laughs> up their ego and talk about cool shit that nobody else understands. And so, <laughs> if you can hire a gaggle, yeah, <laughs> I had to laugh so hard, that's great, honestly. If you can hire a whole gaggle of them, then yeah, that's the way to go. If you can only afford one, don't, because you're only going to stay three months and then he's going to get bored because he's the only smart person in your organization he's going to walk away. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, <laughs> hold on, I wasn't done yet, I wasn't done yet. Are you, are you sad today? No, 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 hold on, hold on. And the second one, it's more important, I think, the data scientist itself will not make you money. Right, they're, they're not, not going to take an action. They're not going to change the marketing spend. They're, they're just, in, they're just going to inform that. And I honestly believe there's enough intelligence out there with things that you're already doing. You just need someone invest in someone that understands the the, the market space, the the mechanics that are going on. Not somebody that feeds more intel. There's plenty of intel out there. Somebody that creates a strategy and implements it, I think, is going to be more useful. Like a marketing manager that really understands data and the value it can generate, rather than another guy creating a report. I, th Great. I think. And, and I uh, echo that, Christian, in that, you know, for the last few years, I've built a whole online course of marketing managers, I've written books, and it's amazing how few marketing managers invest in education. They have the role, but we have marketing manager certification, digital marketing, detail courses, Google Analytics, deep dive, and when you think of 17,000 dealerships and maybe 10,000 marketing managers to, to see how few people actually invest in our online courses and certifications, it's quite sad. So let's ask another question. Guys, outside of, this is an open question. One piece of advice, we're gonna start with Christian. We're gonna go down. Don't what? worry, it'll be depressing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I, don't know. I, didn't, I didn't get that impression, did I? One piece of advice, Christian, as we close, because we only have a few minutes left. One, what's one piece of advice you'd like to leave this group of dealers with? Just walk outside into the ocean and kill yourself. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, I was expecting that, wasn't it? No, um, I don't know. Like, you guys are already doing the right thing, right? You're here. So you're having, you're having the dialogue and you're talking about it. And, and so... Keep, keep doing that, yeah? I think investing in education is the biggest thing. Like, you gotta be educated, you gotta know what's going on so you can, you can navigate your way through all the fluff that's out there and, and you're gonna have to navigate that way yourself. So I think ongoing education is, is the best thing. Keep coming back to these events. Yeah. I'd say do something. I, I think there's been a lot of talk uh, on this panel over here about uh, some challenges in the industry and those definitely, those definitely exist. Uh, but for our clients that figure out solutions, um, and we work together to figure out solutions, you can get fantastic results. Uh, and that is outside the automotive industry and it's inside the, the automotive industry. Uh, you know, just uh, we're, we're standing up a client today for a group of dealerships in the mid-Atlantic region where we are pulling in sales into our attribution model and helping them understand what digital media is actually driving sales. Uh, and they were the first group of dealerships that came to us that had invested the time, had understood the realities, and then we worked together to craft that solution uh, and so there may be gaps, there may be holes, but when you put some effort into it, you can certainly create, uh, create uh, fantastic results. So get started.
get started. Yep. All right. Go ahead. Uh, I'd say let your CRM drive the decisions that you're making from an advertising perspective. Those are either your consumers or people who are not interested in you. There is information and nuggets in there and use that data to help you drive the decisions that you're going to make going forward. Uh, some attribution is better than no attribution, but attribution can also be terribly misleading. So um, my advice would be to uh, participate in the largest ecosystem that you can, and it's likely beyond this room. Um, we don't have the scale in automotive to get the accuracy that we all need to really know what's moving the needle. This whole cross-device thing, which is the core of knowing all of an individual's devices and cookies and browsers, requires massive scale. And, um, and so a 35% match rate um, is good, and it might be directional, but what the hardest people to match are people who, are, who use multiple devices. They use an iPad, they use a phone, they use multiple, a laptop, multiple browsers are also your most valuable customers, so it might be steering you in the wrong direction. So um, look for scale, uh, look for a large ecosystem that something, somebody like a live ramp can provide, or a, um, Adobe or Oracle, if, you can, um, if they roll out um, products for small businesses, is my, my advice. I think it's very similar uh, w advice that I would give to what was just given, maybe just a little bit more tactical, which is to create four 90-day plans to have, again, like a breakthrough and understanding each quarter in what's driving your business. You know, have somebody teach you attribution, have somebody teach you propensity four times in the year. And the, and the cycle is learn, do, learn, do, right? So your first quarter should be give your digital marketing person, your agency, whatever, say you've got three months to come up with something that's going to blow my mind about how I understand how this works. And then I'm going to take action with you afterwards, or I'm going to take action in the appropriate place with you afterwards and do that four times next year. Don't try to boil the whole, whole ocean. I think you're right. Start somewhere. But don't, don't look at this as like one big daunting monolithic issue to tackle. Slice it up into pieces and demand that each of those pieces is, is meaningful and impactful. And, and don't try to solve this all in January. Just make sure that by the end of 2018, you feel a whole lot better about this than you do right now. Great, great. So before we break for lunch, I wanted to share some breaking news. Uh, Paul Schnell, wherever Paul's sitting now, did he move again? Uh, oh, hi, and he's standing now. Um, Paul Schnell in the feedback said, hey, I, I would have liked to seen some more actionable things. The reason why I put the poll question on whether you felt that there's a movement established and started here about the need for the competitors in this room to work with a common standard, most of you said absolutely not. I have a different perspective because for the last 12 years, I've worked to be a dealer advocate. There's a certain level of trust that dealers place in me because I'm willing to go to court to defend them. I'm willing to write and call out wrongs. And there's very few of those uh, independent voices that understand Peter and, and his psychologist. But you, you get the idea. Um, I, I know what the marketing managers in this room, from the largest groups down to a single store, are going through. And, and I've been committed for the last five years in, in building a platform, an independent platform, to bring all the data together. This conference is an education for me as well as I learn more about Visual IQ and LiveRamp and, and all the companies that are here. I love Christian's presentation yesterday. I thought he put together a, a, an example way in which this attribution needs to move forward and how, how it's done. So uh, I'm proud to announce that cars.com uh, approached us yesterday and said, Brian, we're totally bought in. We want uh, you to be able to put a tracking pixel on our, our platform and report on our numbers. Your numbers is our numbers. And um, be in that bake-off. So I think that Cars.com had done this first with Clairvoy, and that was a huge breakthrough for Steve White. And Steve White is a peer with us to help dealers have a trusted place for reporting and attribution. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference is starting a change management movement. For the vendors here in this room, you heard DMS and CRM as two of the biggest pain points that we need to solve to allow marketing companies that represent re represented here to plug into DMS and CRM data. It's, it's embarrassing. 
that probably the best uh, CRM API that we know of is 10x better than anyone else's, meaning the largest CRM companies have the shittiest APIs in 2017. It's, it's laughable. So I'm hoping that as cars.com says, Brian, we believe what you're doing in Vistadash. We want dealers to trust our data. Our VDP counts are our VDP counts. Audience overlap, you know, um, they're saying dealers are trusting us, um, trusting uh, Clairvoy to be an independent auditor. Do you think that's great news? <laughs> it's wonderful news because here's, here's what the dealers have spoken. They, they want help, they need technology, they need people who are responsive, but they need an ecosystem where they can access their data quickly, hire smart companies to help them, and we need to work more closely together. The vision of this conference is really coming to fruition. A lot of positive feedback, love your feedback on how to get better, but right now, we better go eat lunch. So please enjoy lunch and we'll be kicking it off with great workshops this afternoon.